we go live. Uh, hello, Adi Dykeman. Great to have you on for a chat. Real honor. And um, yeah, thanks for the time. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Great to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, Adi's been a friend. I look back in our Facebook chat for like six years since I begged to be a part of Type 1 Grit. Um, friend of ours, Troy Stapleton, said, yeah, you should check out Type 1 Grit. And uh, we joined and radically been life-changing and, and really amazingly changed their life. So it's a real thrill to finally get to talk to you after being friends and interacting for so long online. So, yeah, it's, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, very, that's encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. So um, so Adi is, is Mr. Type 1 Grit, co-founded how many years? Maybe seven years ago. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, with um, Alison Hershey and... Uh, a couple of other people and um, it's just been going strong and just helping people grow and understand how to apply a fairly radical approach to management of type 1 diabetes that changes their lives and it's an amazing insight for people in the rest of the world to you know we have this privilege of you've got a son with type 1 diabetes and I've got a wife and we get to have this guinea pig to live with to understand how metabolism works and it's yeah. really a unique insight on the world so yeah it's really interesting yeah yeah it's um, um yeah so you're a you're a physicist by day phd or you can't disclose fully what you do as a day job but uh pretty much literally a rocket scientist so um not yeah. a doctor um, yeah 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 but uh and we, we saw these lines on grit and we were completely blown away um, just uh, money just went, okay, this is achievable in real life with people with type 1 diabetes. And yeah, you've just changed so many lives. Yeah, that's, uh, I think the, the group started about uh, seven years ago. And, um, you know, my son was diagnosed just a little before then. And we were, we were looking for answers because the, the diet we were prescribed wasn't working at all for him. And, um, we found out it doesn't work for anybody. And, um, I, I met um, Allison, you mentioned, and Debbie Wright Terrio and uh, Derek uh, Rollerson. And, um, you know, they're, they're type ones, but adults. But, um, you know, every type one that I, I found that was having some success was doing the same thing. And yeah. uh, so we started doing that same thing as well. And that's... Yeah, Dave here when he was diagnosed, what, back in when he was 10? Yeah, he was nine, and it was in 2013 in March. And uh, he, we didn't know anything about diabetes, and um, Dave was really sick, and his pediatrician missed it. That's a very common thing wow. for the pediatricians to miss it. And, um, and so he got he almost died. Dave almost died. I mean, I've told the story a few times in social media, but um, he was not lucky uh, at all. You know, misdiagnosed. Wow. And, um, you know, we were probably a few hours away from Dave passing away. Wow. And um, it was, it was, a, it was a real horror Marty. And I'm still deeply affected by that experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was a traumatic experience for me personally. And, um, mm -hmm. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't gotten over it. It, it has, wow. I, I put it to, to positive use in my care of Dave and, um, it, it determined and, and hardened me to make sure that I didn't make another mistake, um, with his health. Um, yeah, you've been a passionate advocate for his health, but also, you know, me through this journey, I look back at what money was like when she was 10 and i met her when we were like 22 or whatever and like the what could her life have been like if she was able to find this way of eating back then and she yeah. you know we had a friend who was di uh, mentioned that their 12 year old daughter was diagnosed a couple of days ago and it's just oh yeah heartbreaking and and she goes well this kid could start out the type one journey right with good knowledge and not be so screwed up by just the general advice about food that, that leaves you in a really bad place. Um, yeah. So yeah, when, Dave, when Dave was diagnosed, it, it required a little bit of luck 
to understand or to learn that what, what the right way to approach diabetes management. Um, and so I guess you could characterize the mission that we're sort of on is trying to make it so that it's a choice and not necessarily luck that uh, mm. changes your fate. Um, in 2013, when Dave was diagnosed, uh, there was nobody who was uh, who knew about here's diabetes solution who knew about the book, and uh, my wife happened to get the book, um, and and that that is what started us on this path. But um, no one really knew about it then, and there wasn't any discussion about it on social mm -hmm. media. I think now you can see the flat lines everywhere and in, in the uh -huh. Facebook groups and people mentioning the Bernstein book and people mentioning, you know, their A1Cs and, and constructive solutions to problems that are mm -hmm. based in um, correct thinking. And um, so uh, I think, and, and of course there's studies now. So yeah. we, I think we've really accomplished a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is the, the Harvard study in um, the pediatrics, yeah, pretty amazing just to demonstrate that this amazing group of type ones in type one grit have what they call it, exceptional glycemic control is yeah. possible for, for children. It's like Precedent. it's not a fluke, it's just a method. It takes some discipline, but if you yeah. want great control, it is definitely possible. Let me let me um, talk a little bit about that uh, PDF. Yeah, yeah. I never have talked about it. Um, so what happened was, you know, the 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 four people who were friends who were all in, you know, Debbie and, and Allison and Derek and I, uh, we just, we just started meeting others and we just said that the, the chat room is getting too big. So we decided to make this Facebook group of just people who were following the Bernstein methods. And, you know, there's a lot to the diabetes management, even using Dr. B, there's a lot. Mm. So it was, it's helpful to be around people who are doing it too. So mm. we started this group. And the group grew and grew and, um, you know, the, the researchers became aware of it and we were getting approached by a lot of researchers. Mm. Uh, but you know, then we got approached by some real serious people at uh, Harvard and Boston's children's hospital. And they were, they were a uh, shoe in to do some correct science and have a real serious approach. So, uh, you know, what, what they did was they they had a, a survey, but the survey wasn't just a survey. It was it was mm. verified by medical records from doctors. Mm. This is a serious study that merited publication in a serious journal. And the interesting thing is that we didn't just demonstrate unprecedented glycemic control. There was a whole list of other things that were found. Mm. We found that unlike the the general type one population, which is uh, has a lot of obesity and, and double diabetes, meaning both yeah. type one and type two. Our, our cohort had normal BMIs. We had uh, great trig to HDL ratios, which is a big risk factor. Mm. We had uh, uh, no sign of any growth issues amongst the kids. We had uh, less adverse effects like less DKA, less hypoglycemia the quality of life was improved. So it's, it's like a master, uh, work. And yeah. it, it's, it goes far beyond what, um, critics, uh, like to say about it, which is that it's just some survey. Uh, <laughs> it's not survey. It's a validation of Bernstein's approach. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Money was contacted for it as well. And like, they wanted the entire medical record. It wasn't just like ticker box and, and finish yeah. the survey, it was a, a very big deal. So I suppose talking of um, growth, um, uh, let, let's just riff on Bernstein for a second. Who's Dr. Bernstein? He's a pretty amazing dude. Yeah. Um, engineer yeah. come doctor, now 85. Yeah, his story Look, is, uh, see. His story is um, that he was diagnosed at the same age as Dave, but of course, many decades earlier, but yeah. as a young guy, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, around that age. And, uh, you know, back then he's 87. So there was no blood sugar meters. So you were really and barely any, any insulin. So he was really flying blind and, um, his blood, blood sugar 
uh, was all over the place because there was no way to, you know, properly titrate his insulin and his diet. And what he did was, it's a long story, but he, he got a hold of the first blood mm. sugar meter commercially available. Yeah, it looks like a big old VCR or something. Yeah. And he he learned um, while he was having basically kidney failure, uh, you know, late stage kidney disease and, uh, and a ton of other complications that he had developed. He learned um, how to control his blood sugar. And uh, he learned that it was carbohydrate that was the most potent determiner of of uh of postprandial blood sugars, and he removes the carbohydrate from his diet, and then determined that the rest of the glycemic response from protein and fat was something that you could actually manage. Mm. And um, he developed his law of small numbers, and um, his life changed. His he he changed everything about his his complications reversed, and he felt so obligated to take this message out that he, as an engineer at Bell Labs, he he wrote a paper, but the paper yeah. was rejected because so, he didn't have a, a medical degree. So he, at 44, he went to medical school. And, uh, you know, he, his latest story is that he, he when he was, a, he was sort of a, a prodigy as a, a young guy intellectually, he was the youngest guy to get into Columbia. And then mm -hmm. he was the oldest guy to get into uh, medical school <laughs> so he, he got into um you know uh he got out of physics and engineering and he got into medicine because he felt a moral obligation to teach people what he had done to write his diabetes to optimize his diabetes and mm. uh, he's still working on that same problem now for a fourth decade he's working yeah. on helping others yeah continuing to refine it and share it and yeah, it's amazing that what he's done and, and his knowledge isn't more well known uh, around the place yeah. i think um richard Feynman described you as uh dr bernstein incarnate on social media or on earth or something to that effect which um, i thought was a great description he, he's a I, i'm like a graduate student he's uh he's a true giant intellectually um so I, I've had some experience around physicists who are of similar, uh, you know, up in the rarefied air and uh, uh, Bernstein's the same. And, um, you know, I thought, well, we could, we were so lucky to mm. learn from the book. Maybe I can pitch in and get this guy on video and record, cause there's so much more than just the book. So. Yeah, you've, um, you've got, a ton of, of, of videos that you've captured him on YouTube. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make him immortal on YouTube. I'm trying to immortalize Bernstein on YouTube. So yeah, yeah. which is a very worthy goal because yeah, he's nobody lives forever and he's done incredibly well. But it's great to capture all his insights for everybody for, for all time. As, yeah, as an amazing giant. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, we'll just um. I suppose the more shameless photos of, of, of Dave, because um, this is a bit yeah. of a, a love story as well, a fit for your yeah. son. Um, yeah. We've got, here he is um, playing basketball um, yeah. in, in the gridiron team, um, yeah. outgrowing his mum like uh, like our 14-year-old son. And, yeah, he's obviously thriving pretty well and, and doing um, excellent. Yeah. You've got a shot here of him now sharing all his knowledge and, and experience. Yes. Yeah, you can see he's he's now he's kind of a man now. He's he's standing back to back against me, not not as much anymore. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to share my insight and and my learning from um, type one diabetes about how insulin works, and this is. Uh, you guys don't use a, a closed loop pump system. I think you guys are still on the insulin needles, but yeah. um, this is our Android APS um, closed yeah. loop Dexcom arrangement where this is Monty's blood sugar, which is sort of like the, the fuel tank. And I think you were one of the early people to dabble with data-driven fasting. Um, and you can think of this as like the fuel that fuel rises when you eat 
and then insulin this line up here just keeps on the artificial pancreas system keeps on jamming in more insulin increases the base cell just gently every five minutes to yeah. shut off the fuel supply from your through your liver for, of your stored energy so it's it's not everybody thinks of this uh, insulin as this magic hormone that catches fat from nowhere or catches energy from nowhere and stores it it's really just the the break on your liver that holds back the flow of energy into your bloodstream and that that's been just a right. Yeah. You know, type 1 diabetes has been such a mind-blowing um, experience for me to understand more about metabolism and like you, I'm just so eager to share it. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we wanted to wrap on um, the, the the big fat keto lies. You had a look at the book and so this is really yeah. cool. We can talk about how they apply to type 1 diabetes. So the first one is optimal ketosis is a goal. More ketones are better. And we've all been on this journey of um you know chasing ketones and the keto movement and it's gone up and come back down over the last couple of years and yeah what's your reflection on this um type 1 diabe diabetics are afraid right. too many ketones and they should be but you know some ketones is okay but it's not necessarily a goal is, is that sort of how you see it well I, first first of all let me let me see your um your uh your graph, your CGM graph that you just showed. Oh, yeah. I wanted to say something about that. This is a funny thing that you bring up because the way that I met Bernstein was that um, I do real-time signal processing yeah. for a living, sensor processing. So when I was explained how insulin and how glucose works, and it wasn't the correct way which you described it, but nevertheless, insulin makes mm blood sugar go down and carbs make it go up. That was the rudimentary. And, mm. and a time series, like what you're showing here was was drawn. And I figured uh, when, when we were explained this, when Dave was in DKA and we were at the hospital, I figured, I would, gee, I'm smart enough to make this <sighs> line flat. And so while Roxanne was busy Googling and learning real things and buying the Bernstein book and it was <laughs> Delivered, I was doing experiments with Dave and because we didn't have the actuator, I was the actuator and making, I was making the, in, the insulin and doing the measurements and feeding and trying to get that flat line. And what I discovered was, and I wrote an article on this and I shared it with mm -hmm. Bernie, which is how we originally began being, we became friends. I wrote a, a model and, and, and some expressions to, to characterize the variability in that plot. So how much, how much variation in the, and what I showed was this is, this variability is, is similar to something called the Kramer Rao bound. What I showed was that that variability depends basically on food and insulin mm. that you have to eat low carb, foods and protein foods to be mm. able to control. There's sort of a, in, in some models, you can generate sort of a phase transition where, where you lose control, the system becomes stochastic or turbulent. Mm. And then if you, if you lower the carbohydrate, you can gain control. And that has to do with the, the how fast, you know, it, it, injected insulin doesn't work quickly. The mm. CGM doesn't measure quickly. Mm. And, and rapid acting carbohydrate has too profound of a, a stochastic effect so that you never can get the kind of control that is being advertised by the, the CDEs who push carb counting. Mm. So as I was proving that, we got the book. I opened the book and there was the law of small numbers. And yeah. so I called Bernstein and, you know, that sort of, we sort of hit it off. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we go back to the. Now we can go back. Yeah, uh, so just to, to, to ram home that point. Yeah, the, yeah. The only way to control this line, I spend since we got the the closed loop CGM system that scared the crap out of me because it basically set up, set up the system that could kill the wife overnight. So I'm watching it day and night and trying to control it and fine tune it. We've got it to a point where it's pretty damn good and we love it to death. But um, yeah. The only way to control it is to have those smaller inputs. And when she eats protein, she can just dose with it with a nice, consistent, long-acting um, uh, you know, e-carbs bolus little 
drip feed insulin over five hours and it'll be flat line with a, a steak for lunch but if she goes out and there's nothing else to eat and she has to eat with friends and something that's just like carbs and fat together it's just this long extended up and down and the insulin's just like hammering away for 36 yeah. hours later after one meal and it's like there's no way to control that with right injected insulin and it's really an amazing lab for how our bodies function and how we can control insulin it's avoid those carb plus fat protein foods and if you've got elevated blood sugars dial the carbohydrates back down because bernstein's law of small numbers all about you know managing small inputs lead to small errors and then you can make small corrections and type one is all about just progressively correcting and, and you know, re-guiding the rudder of the ship to, to yeah. get towards your destination. So anyway, um, yeah. yeah, so... All right, so um, ketones, yeah. Do, should you okay. taste ketones on a, as a type 1 diabetic? Okay, so, so yeah, so it's funny because in most of these uh, low-carb type 2 groups, everyone's crazy about ketones and they want ketones because they think that it means that they're losing weight, which isn't necessarily true. And then... And the type one groups, uh, which are not not the low carb ones, everyone thinks that ketones are poison. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I guess that's to be understood to some extent because once you the first time you see ketones, you might be in the same shape that day was, and you don't understand mm. that they're of a, they're a normal physiologic ingredient. Mm. And then, but the but the low carbers. So how about the grit people? And how about Bernstein? Nobody's nobody in grit and Bernstein care about their ketones mm. you know there's no post in type one grit what are your ketones today you know <laughs> nobody cares and um it, it's because they're sort of irrelevant and especially the number is irrelevant what once you sort of understand uh ketosis it it generating a certain value of ketones becomes less and less interesting um once you grasp the concept so there's no, you know, we sh in Bernstein we shoot for uh, in 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 grit we sh we're following Bernstein and Bernstein's shooting for for protein nutrition yep. and he's shooting for normal blood sugars, but he, he, himself, he never measures his ketones and I'll ask him offline, go get a blood ketone meter. I want to see what your ketones are. He doesn't have one. <laughs> you know, why? What well, would it matter what my ketones were? I'm, I'm <laughs> you know, that's a good point, right? Waste oh. time, waste money. And that's what a lot of us have found over years of measuring ketones. It's like, oh, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. What do I do with that data? You know, cool. Like, y yeah. if you manage the inputs, the outputs like uh, look after themselves. And yeah. ketones, some level of ketones is a symptom of a, a low carb diet or fat loss. But chasing yeah. ketones just by manipulating that number is just symptom management and doesn't necessarily lead to weight loss. Well, yeah, one thing like, like, like you buttered know, coffee. Yeah. One, one trick to lower your ketones would be to hold back on protein. And you and I know that that's a terrible thing to be doing. So, yeah. especially with children. So, yeah. anyone who's trying to get their ketones up uh, by eating fat and avoiding protein is making, and that's a constant theme of this conversation, I'm sure. But <laughs> um, so you have to be in ketosis to burn fat. Well, this is another one. So uh, this is a, uh, a sub-myth among uh, uh, in another myth, which is given to you by the dietitians when you're diagnosed, that carbohydrates are, are used for energy. And the, the, the dietitians are so off base with uh, fat, dietary fat, that they won't even admit that normal physiology mm. shows that we are burning combination of glucose mm -hmm. and fat and the reality is that you're burning fat all the time uh, in a mixture with glucose and basically it's in proportion to what you're eating so if mm -hmm. you're eating a lot of glucose food like the modern obesogenic processed diet then you'll be burning more glucose than free fatty acids mm -hmm. likely and if you're if you're eating more of a uh meat and veg sort of a species uh appropriate diet then you're going to be using the fat that's in the protein food mm -hmm. for fuel your body is not gonna try to convert one to the other and then use it it's going to try to use 
as efficiently as possible without changing much of it. So and most of the time you're doing that in the Krebs cycle as normal, you know, everyday life. And then if you don't in starvation, for example, if you've got no carbs and no protein, you'll burn fat by ketosis, which is a sort of a separate pathway when you've yeah. got not a lot, not enough oxaloacetate from protein and, right. and carbs, as Mike Julian so eloquently explained right. to me one day. I went, ah, yeah, you don't have to be in ketosis to burn fat. Right. Uh, yeah, and Mike, it's only Mike when you deprive yourself yeah. of protein and carbs that you're going to be in ketosis. It's not necessarily a goal. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, Mike taught me that too. And, and Bernstein told me that too, but he has a, a more pra his practical. Uh, way of saying that is uh, if, if I suppose if you've, you're testing yourself with for ketones and you see that your ketones are up, it's time to eat a meal of protein, yeah. which is the perfect way to say it. So my little story there is that um, I have a younger non-diabetic son, Marty, and he's a water polo player. And he had practice last year around three o'clock to four thirty. And then the coach asked him to practice with the varsity. Once he's getting good, and you want to see how you do with the varsity. So he practiced from 4.30 to 6 with the varsity. So I was what? waiting. And then they had a 6 o'clock scrimmage, and he played in that too. And, I mean, I saw this kid, my kid, for f maybe five hours in a pool. And it was like, man, it was like sprint, 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 sprint. So he gets in the car. We're driving home. And he says, I've never been so tired. I said, we should measure your ketones. So we get home, <laughs> measure his blood sugar. His blood sugar is like 64. So oh. for, that's below four millimoles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then his ketones were five millimoles, which, are, yeah. you know, that's, yeah. And I said, that's exactly what I would have expected. And, yeah. and so it's time to eat a steak, you know. And then so he ate a steak and we measured in the morning and they were already down to like 1.6. And then by the evening, he, they were back to, 0.2, 0.3, like you always say. So there's the body working the way it should, right? Yeah. So yeah, we just can't, you know, using ketones as a driver for our decision making just ends in pain and agony. But um, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. So um, number three, you should be uh, should eat more fat to burn more fat. What happens when? Um, I think Allison's got a great story. Yeah. Let's um, hear it. To chase ketones and she just got these photos where she just kept on ballooning up and doubled her daily insulin dose and then she went back to high satiety nutrient dense with intermittent fasting and just lost it all and looks fantastic and is thriving again oh, so yeah. it's like uh, just uh, type ones are a great as i keep saying guinea pig to to see how this works for people well, that's another good one. I have a good story about Dave that's a practical story. You know, the, the bottom line here is that when you're eating fat, you're going to supplant the fat that you would have burned off your body, right? So if you're loading up on a meal of fat to try to avoid, to try to help increase your own fat, you're actually doing the opposite of what you should be doing. So that... The, the famous phrase with Lewis and Tyler and the keto gains guys is fat is a lever. Yeah. So when I want to lose weight, I decrease my carbs and my fat and increase my protein Ted Damon style. Mm. But what about Dave as a kid? Mm. He's using fat. He's in a good example of fat as a lever, but in the opposite direction. So mm. if Dave has one of these events like Hayden had with the, with the water polo, which a, a young athlete's going to have, you know, where he's in basketball, he, he, Dave would go from football practice to basketball practice and then come home and he'll, he'll have burned 800 calories mm. and I can feed him like a big steak and that's, that's, or, you know, a big piece of protein, mm. but you, you, protein is so high in satiety value, um, that he is going to need more calories and, because the insulin doses that Dave takes are sort of fixed because he takes his shot in the morning. If I don't add fat to mm. break, to, 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 to take those calories and keep them equal, mm. right. To replace the calories spent, he'll go, he'll have hypoglycemia all night because there's too much insulin and not enough energy in his body. So mm. it's it, it, this, this, this is, shows a, a few points that we're, we're going to mm. be making. 
thinking. But so Dave needs that fat to so that he doesn't get too lean, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's his primary energy source because he's a low carber. So we'll give him higher fat foods. And so he has like a protein shake with some heavy cream and water and ice that he has as sort of like a dessert along with his dinner. And that, mm -hmm. that will go a long way to, to reconstituting those calories and then preventing his hypoglycemia at night because he's got too much insulin on board. Yeah, with data driven fasting, it's fascinating to see all these keto people come on and go, my fasting insulin is really high, my, my fasting glucose is really high, what do I do? And once they focus on, you know, getting adequate protein, nutrients and dialing back their dietary fat, all of a sudden their blood sugars in the morning are plummeting because they don't have all this excess energy floating around their bloodstream. Yeah. Yeah, fat's definitely a fuel. And, and I've, I've pretty much heard Dr. B talk about the same sort of thing. If you want to gain weight, he doesn't quite say use fat as a lever, but that's pretty much it. Add more fat for energy to gain weight, drop fat to lose body fat. And it's like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> it's not what yeah. we believe for a lot of time. So in, Ted, in Bernstein, a little, he's a little different than Ted. Bernstein doesn't because I think Ted is, is sort of – reacting to the keto movement where people were actually seeking out meals of fat. And mm. this, this caught Bernstein off guard because he never anticipated that anyone would go out and eat a meal of cream cheese for dinner. But we were seeing that. And then he started to see that too. So instead of doing the and treating fat as a free variable, Bernstein incorporates it into the protein food and mm. says that, all the fat that you need is in the protein food. You don't, he's, so Bernstein's funny line is I, I was cooking coconut or eggs in coconut oil before you were, before, <laughs> while you were in diapers. <laughs> but, I'm not, but I'm not out drinking a glass of coconut oil. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, some people are. And he said, what? <laughs> what? How did they do that? Raise yeah. pizza. Does um, you do bulletproof coffee? Bernstein, <laughs> he, he, you know, he's normal. So he has a little, he might have a little half teaspoon or tablespoon of, of cream in his coffee. But the idea of, you know, he was on the Jimmy Moore show and Jimmy tried to convince him that somehow there was something about eating the butter on the table before the bread came. And, 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 you know, that was kind of, it, it didn't make, you could tell Bernstein just didn't quite understand what was being implied there because who would eat a, a, a bowl of butter at the table before your meal came? It was not a, it would be a very a awkward thing to be doing in, at the, at a, in a, in a dinner environment. So. Not, not so, not all to be. so should yeah. you avoid uh, protein to uh, avoid gluconeogenesis? This is probably the thing that triggers you the most in all of this, isn't it? Oh man. So uh, <laughs> this is my biggie, man. So here's the thing. Uh, type ones, they need to take insulin to cover their protein. If you go low carb, you don't go no insulin and you don't sort of cure your diabetes. The, the thing, and it's not even well known. In fact, some, some of these uh, low level researchers, they, they're acting like they've discovered something that protein uh, generates an, uh, an insulin response, <laughs> something that's been known forever. So what happens is dietary amino acids, when they raise in concentration in your bloodstream after you eat, uh, they provoke in a non-diabetic a gluc glucagon response, which mm -hmm. provokes an insulin response. And those two hormones counteract each other in the pancreas. With a type 1... The glucagon escapes and it's it's not shunted at the surface of the alpha cells. It goes out into the bloodstream and it hits the liver. And as the protein is digested, more glucagon is released. It hits the liver and the liver starts dumping its stored glucose. And that's what you see when you don't use insulin to cover a, a cheeseburger. Mm. And... So what do you do? Instantly turning to glucose in the blood. It's the stored. It's the stored glycogen in the liver. So we all store glycogen in our liver. 
And so what do you do? And this is the miracle of injected insulin. You, you inject insulin and it doesn't stop the glucagon from being released at the alpha cell the way normal a normal pancreas works, mm. but it does stop the action of the glucagon at the site of the liver. And mm. so the glycogenolysis, which is a Mike Julian word that he taught me, uh, the glycogenolysis stops and the amino acids are metabolized the way they should be. If you don't cover mm. uh, the glucose, then the, glu the, gly the, the glucagon, mm -hmm. then yeah, if you don't cover the protein, then the, the glycogen is released from the liver, the blood sugar goes up, and then the liver wants to reconstitute its stored glycogen and gluconeogenesis rates increase. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're, you're, if you're not covering your protein correctly, then your protein metabolism is acting very inefficiently. Mm. And um, um, one of the myths in the type one world is that we need to be eating carbohydrates because protein requires insulin. And that means protein is being turned into glucose and it's not being turned into glucose. Insulin has many functions, not just shoving glucose around. Mm. In fact, mm. what we're using insulin for to cover protein is to prevent it from being converted yeah. into glucose. Yeah. So th this, there's, there's so many myths are coming from this. So another myth that comes from it is <laughs> insulin is the fat storage hormone. We want insulin to be zero. Don't eat protein because it turns to, car to glucose and that provokes an insulin response. So that's, that's, a, that's a myth on the type two side. And then mm. and there's the myths on the type one side and proper, proper physiology and proper biochemistry resolve both myths. Yeah. 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 Once you understand that, you know, you've always got basal insulin going around and like maybe 80% of the insulin your pancreas produces is just to hold your stored muscle and fat in storage. Right. That's right. The way yeah. to reduce that is to reduce your amount of body fat that you're trying to hold in storage. So the question is then, how do you reduce that? It's a high satiety diet. It's not, you know, eating more fat that you still need to hold your body fat in storage while you use up the, the dietary fat. So at the fullness of time, you still get an insulin response. Yeah. So you and you and Rob Wolf introduced the satiety and hyper palatability. <laughs> Uh, ideas to me and that seems to be the missing piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. is for for obesity and type 2 is that is that hunger uh you mm -hmm. know cal calories avoid it and um and the, the the insulin hypothesis avoids it it's really all about hunger control and i think everybody eats till they, they're not hungry anymore everybody stops eating when you know, unless you're a bodybuilder and get this amazing self-control, but most people can't sustain that. So you need to find a way that fine-tunes your diet. Like you're saying for Dave, he needs more dietary fat to prevent him from losing weight. But, you know, the other, rest of the world, most of us need yeah. to dial back the, the, the fat and carbs and up the protein percentage. Well, when, when I was a kid, I would always be in the fridge for Twinkies and crap, you know, cereal. I've never seen my kids going in the fridge, uh, you know, that boredom kind of thing. And it's because we eat three or four meals a day that lead with protein. And when you yeah. eat right, you don't need to eat until lunch. There's, mm. you can't, like boredom is not going to overcome this, you know, feeling like I'm full, you know, mm. I don't need to eat. So I see my kids. They have they have good diet habits because mm. they're eating the right thing. You know they're not developing this nervous kind of tick mm. to eat um, you know junk food. Yeah. So um, fat is a free food because it doesn't elicit elicit an insulin response. Yeah. This is another one. Is that uh, I think when you and I were getting into this game, there was this uh, belief that we should be eating cream cheese and salami and all these really high fat foods. There's some type two groups, you know, mm. um, unfortunately, a lot of the people in those groups, they never make any progress. And it's mm. because um, they, they feel like uh, fat is some sort of 
uh, equivalent to dietary helium, you know, that mm. it's, it, it, it's inert. Uh, it's not true. If you eat a bunch of fat, um, as a, so again, like we learn a lot, you and I learn a lot cause we're around type ones. Um, if I see Dave eating a high fat dessert and he hasn't, uh, worked out during the day, I know that his energy balance is different than the day before. So he's going to go high at night because mm. he'll need more insulin to cover that mm. extra energy that's out there in the form of fat. And just so the fat is a lever on it on a day to day basis with him. And, and I have to control both. If he eats more fat during the day, um, I have to cover that with somehow increasing his basal insulin at night. Mm. So it does elicit uh, 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 an insulin response. It's a basal insulin response. It's a yeah. response over eight to 12 hours. Yeah, so it's easy to manage for someone with type 1 diabetes or even type 2 diabetes to some degree to go on a low-carb diet and eat more fat, but it, 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 you know, because it has a shorter term, it has a longer term insulin response, you're, you're lowering the things that cause a short term insulin response, but over the fullness of time, energy balance still matters and calories are you know, somewhat calories and you still have to find a way that, to eat less uh, yeah. without going crazy with hunger. But what um, are you, what, and what are you achieving on a dietary basis? When you're eating refined fats, you're eating empty calories too. So yeah, you're missing out on it. It's through the floor. Yeah, you need the you need to you need to eat protein foods. We're not trying to not eat. We're just it just it's sort of a miracle that the um you know the the easiest way to manage type one appears to be the most optimal from a dietary standpoint. Yeah, definitely. Um so food quality is not important, it's all about insulin and avoiding carbs. And I think Dr. Bernstein is all about prioritized protein and he allows it's not a zero carb diet, it's a you know right. 12 grams at each meal, six grams in the morning sort of thing or, or thereabouts. And that allows intentionally, you read his book and he says, I, I, I know you need to get minerals which come from the green veggies. So you need to not avoid those. Yeah, the, the people in the type one grit group are eating more vegetables than I certainly I ate as a kid. Yeah. My kids eat more vegetables than I eat as a kid. You know, I'm good friends with um, Bethany, the let let me 83 let me be 83 yeah. founder and uh, her son rivers uh, you always see him eating these meals that look like you designed them <laughs> so if you do the math though so bernstein allows 30 grams of carbs a day if you do the math for fib fibrous vegetables mm. that's, a, that's a ton of vegetables i mean 30 grams just look at a, a big bag of frozen vegetables man 30 grams of carbs is a lot of a lot of uh, phytonutrient from fibrous vegetables. So he doesn't want us to to lose out on the nutrients. We're not we're not shooting for the carbohydrate. We're shooting for the nutrients. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thoughts on fasting? Fasting is longer, better is longer, longer is better. Sorry, um, for type ones. Yeah. Well, if you if you fasting as a type one, you're playing with fire because you're as a as a as a non-diabetic what's happening your 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 basal insulin levels going down and down and down and so as a type one you've got to do that mechanically mm. and, uh changing your basal rate there's a lot of there's a lot of trial and error to get your basal rate correct so if you mm -hmm. do that you don't want to mess with it so the best strategy for weight loss is more and is less of a fasting thing and more of a uh Ted Naiman thing where you sort of dial in your protein to energy ratio, mm -hmm. figure out your, your, your bolusing for meals, and then keep that energy ratio constant so that your basal insulin can be predictable. You don't want to lose type one's all about predictability. If you lose predictability and you're asking for a loss of predictability when you fast, not, that's, that's, Sorry, in, that, that's in combination to all the other, downsides of fasting which include you know losing look i fasted i tried it i fasted for seven eight days uh and then i went to the gym and tried to do my military press and immediately lost lost 15 pounds off that so i i looked kind of shredded up but i lost 
a lot of muscle and that's the hardest thing to get that's precious so i'm not a, i'm not a big uh i'm not a big i don't i don't i don't know if, what the purpose of fasting is really anymore and for type one it's just a problem of course type one kids kids should never fast so yeah, I think for people who don't have type 1, some level of consistency is a good thing because if you go for three or four days, you're just going to eat whatever you can get to stuff in your face at the end of it. Nobody eats the steak and broccoli at the end of a week-long fast. I did. <laughs> you did? Okay. You are, you're incredible. Uh, you, 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 your self-discipline is a whole lot better than mine. Um, in terms of calories don't count, yeah so uh this is the idea that if you if you only tip your if you get rid of carbohydrates and lower your insulin somehow you're going to be able to magically eat more food i guess is that the idea and then and then the the these keto dessert um things took off and they keep you can see people stalled for years now in the keto mm. that adopt this lchf it, it uh it's kind of sad, but they uh, they they sort of they sort of took that um, that personally. But um, the calories matter, man. Your energies th that you take in, that's you know, you're you're trying to limit your energy in the smartest way possible if you want to lose weight. And the smartest way possible is to continue supporting your lean muscle mass with protein, but limit your dietary energy intake so that you can enable your body fat that's stored as, as part of that energy equation. So. Yeah, it doesn't just work that it goes, you know, reduce carbs, reduce insulin, fade away to nothing. And you can do that as a type one diabetic, but it's called diabetic ketoacidosis and, <laughs> or diabolemia. And, you know, yeah. being, like, that's what I thought I was trying to do with a, a low carb diet and eating more and more fat in the past. But I, I just, in the mirror and it didn't wasn't working i don't see it's still in the low carb community i don't see i see insulin being demonized i don't see insulin except for you and ted and lewis and and mike and and tyler and i just don't see insulin given any context you know we know that it works on all the macronutrient groups and it's doing different things so you know, I don't, I don't understand the reticence of the low carb community to recognize that protein is insulogenic, insulinogenic, and that it's not because the protein's turning to cake, um, and that that's the context that we want the insulin in. There's a, there's, insulin is not the goal is not zero, like you said. The goal is not ketoacidosis and have the body melt away. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. Um it's all very fascinating what was going to say yeah so uh, we had a bunch of um low carb type one myths that you get hit up with all the time yeah. and you wanted to sort of cover so the first one is isn't dave unhappy eating low carb what about the donuts and croissants and aren't you depriving him in any yeah. Any way yeah that's a good one he gets he get dave gives talks now on his method so he gave a talk to the harvard pediatric group uh, on Skype. And that's the first thing he always gets asked, you know, and the thing is, uh, I, I'm not, Dave's not unusual. Dave, look, if you've, if you've even, he, it was years ago. If you've been on that blood sugar roller coaster, um, it's awful. It's not just this thing that down the road and I have to be you know, I have to delay gratification. It feels awful right away and it ruins your life. You're constantly managing this dangerous roller. You're out of control. You're crashing down, right? And so Dave, you know, that that's sort of, once you find your way out, um, you're not eager. Dave's not eager to eat like a bun or a, a bag of, of gooeys or something like that. And Jack, because you feel like shit. I mean, who wants to feel bad? So he doesn't yeah. do that. And then the other thing is that you can overcome a lot of these problems with with creative cooking. You know, we we focus on protein foods and proper nutrition, but there's 
a ton of stuff that you can eat in place of those things. So it's not really an issue, you know, it, that's sort of, that's, that's just not, that's not an issue. Yeah. So you're worried that Dave will uh, develop an eating disorder? I think Dave has developed an eating order. <laughs> I, think, I think the, the, the concern that Dave would somehow uh, develop an eating disorder because he wasn't um, eating a lot of processed carbohydrate and running his blood sugars high uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, and the literature backs that up, Marty. It's, it's, it's eating disorders correspond to high, high A1Cs and poor metabolic control. So, you know, I, I think the strategy is just the opposite. I think you, you, you teach somebody how to be healthy um, that's not going to cause any problems. It's sort of absurd. Yeah. So, yeah. And that roller coaster, the, the reverse of the law of small numbers, once you're high, you're inje injecting insulin, you're dropping, and you're hungry as anything because your blood sugars are low all of a sudden. So you're eating the crappiest food you can find to raise your blood sugars again, and then you're high again, you're in injecting more insulin. And it's really that mismatch of insulin that drives that double diabetes situation that you know is so endemic in in type ones and you know insulin injecting type twos is it's the mismatch between the crappy high carb high fat foods together that just requires all this insulin that makes them grow bigger and need more insulin and more insulin resistance it's just you know the only way to get off it is to reverse what you're eating i think that's probably the best thing that has been said so far i agree <laughs> that was that was awesome yeah. So um, what's Dave's cholesterol like? You're worried he's going to have a, a heart attack due to high cholesterol with a high fat diet? Well, the, the concern with, with people, including me, when we got started was that type 1 diabetics are dying at a rate of about five times non-diabetics from heart disease and, and living 12, 15, 18 years less if they're diagnosed, especially as kids. So... Uh, then the idea there is that, uh, well, let's pursue cholesterol as the culprit. And that doesn't make a lot of sense because what's, what's type one different? What's different about type ones? And the difference is the blood sugars. And if you go into literature, you'll find that the main focus on type ones should be the prevention of the fundamental risk factor. And that's everybody knows is A1C. So we, what we know now is that even microvascular, let alone macrovascular complications, are continuous reef, are continuous risk factors for from blood sugar that's elevated. So the higher your blood sugar is away from 80s, the more at risk you are from these. Um, yeah. So here, so here's a, a, a here's a statement just came out um, from the ADA and. So what's happening in the world of type one is we're seeing more double diabetes, which you just discussed mm. um, more. There's more obese type one adolescents than in the general population mm. uh, where, where it's already an epidemic. So mm. we've got that obesity and double diabetes. And then on top of that, the blue line here shows that the A1Cs are rising and they're rising catastrophically amongst teens. So for example, Marty, in that pediatrics paper, we had 97% of the gritters were meeting the ADA guidelines. And it's less than 20% of the, the high carb uh, population. So the ADA for many years has been publishing lots of articles on the damage to the brain and the damage uh, to the cardiovascular system from these high blood sugars. And they haven't responded. So the research wing and the research general uh, journal wing over here hasn't sort of been responded to by the guideline wing. And we just saw in, in this February in the diabetes care that the A1C guidelines uh, have been lowered for the pediatric group and the specific damage to the developing child brain um, uh, is, is called out in the abstract. So it's a major change by the ADA. And um, 
you know, the myths in social media are that the kids need carbs for their brain. Mm. And the opposite is true. Kids need normal blood sugars for their brain. The carbohydrate doesn't get in the brain. The glucose gets into the brain. Mm. And what we see is that hyperglycemia damages the child brain. And the ADA is, uh, although has been publishing a number of papers on that topic, they haven't acknowledged it until now in their, in their guidelines. Yeah, and your ability to concentrate when your blood sugars are up and down. As a, as a kid, Monty looks at the kids' lunch boxes at school and the best behaved ones have got the highest quality lunch and the kids are the little brats with ADHD or diagnosed ADHD are the ones with the, you know, everything in a packet and with colors and sugar and flavors and they're the ones you can't control and spend all your time trying to control. So well, it's a different correlation. If they don't eat that stuff, I guess they'll get an eating disorder. I guess that's <laughs> they need the colors and high fructose, and you know. Yeah. Um, so, so is it an issue that a lot of Dave's protein is being converted to glucose to fuel his brain and his um, explosive activity? Is that a, is that a concern? Well, Dave takes insulin to cover his protein, so his protein is metabolized correctly, mm. and the mechanics of of type one are favored for covering protein. Covering carbohydrate with a rapid acting insulin is like shooting a moving target. Mm. And um, you never, and it's with a, with, a, uh, with a broken gun, you're never gonna get the same result twice. Mm. Um, but covering protein with an inter intermediate acting insulin is relatively easy. So if you look at Dave's blood sugar, his average is around 85 and his standard deviation is a little less than 20, which mm. means that his variation is very small. Mm. So even when he corrects, the corrections are small. There's no, there's no fear uh, when he plays sports, there's no fear of hypoglycemia and he doesn't go high so that he has any, um, any of these complications to worry about. So he's playing sports. Does he have depleted glycogen because of his low carb diet? Another another thing you hear a lot. Um, it's interesting when when Dave was diagnosed. Before he was diagnosed, I was his football coach, and I had to put him at quarterback because the quarterback couldn't run back in those days, and Dave was the slowest guy on the team. So he so then he turned into a great quarterback, and then a couple of years after he was diagnosed. Uh, he became the fastest guy on his team, and I see him now winning relays in his um, – he wins relays on his basketball team. Uh, so to me, it's astounding. I was always slow, and that never changed. So he, he's been low-carb and with no uh, deviation for nine years. And um, I've never seen him – just like Hayden, my son, with the water polo. He was mm. going for five hours without – uh, other kids were were crying in the pool, and he was just going back and forth with the varsity guys. So it's just the opposite. This idea that you can sort of, uh, well, I mean, anyone can de deplete their glycogen if they are, you know, running a marathon. And Hayden did do that to an extent. But if you're worried about depleting your glycogen, then what you should do is favor one fuel that isn't glycogen. Yeah. Uh, and so Dave's fat adapted. His uh, glycogen status is um, sort of he doesn't he doesn't burn a lot of carbohydrate for energy. Yeah. So it's, yeah, because you're always tapped into your fat all the time. You just use glycogen occasionally for explosive events, and you you, yeah. you you maintain that all the time, and you can produce enough from the protein you're eating. Yeah, he's not very glycogen dependent, you know. So. Mm. This is, yeah. this is a, a weird, a weird worry that these low carb kids, if, if you eat, if you eat, you know, meat and veg, somehow you're not going to perform. But if you're eating chips and, and, and juice, somehow that's going to give you the, that's going to give you the athletic edge. Yeah. Super athlete. Yeah. yeah I don't think so. Superstar basketball players drink the, you know, Gatorade, and therefore, if I'm sitting on the couch and drink Gatorade, I'll become a superstar. Yeah, I mean, um, if, Dave, if Dave was in a basketball game and he was, you know, dr drifting in the low 70s, he would have a, a little bit of, or if he had some long run to do, he would he would sip a little Gatorade or or yeah. 
a good glucose. Yep. And just keep the blood sugar normal. Yeah. Um, so you're worried about ketones? You've got ketones all the time. What sort of ketone levels did you run? I never really checked Dave's ketones because why? His ketones, I mean, we all eat the same way in my family. And I do have a ketone meter. And, you know, we have checked that. Yep. And we're all like 0.2 or 0.3. And if I if I skip lunch, actually I skip breakfast and lunch today because of uh, a lot to do. And if I get on my spin bike, my ketones might be two, yep. and then after dinner they'll go down again. I mean, I just uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do with these numbers. So the worry for Dave is that people have is they think ketones are poison, and they think that if you have ketones, you're more likely to go into ketoacidosis. And the, the reality is this, Marty, Dave always knows. So ketoacidosis is caused when you don't have insulin on board. That's why Dave went into ketoacidosis because his pancreas stopped working. Hmm. So if you're injecting insulin, what's the best way to know that you're, you have insulin on board? The it's best like, way to know that you have insulin on board is you have normal blood sugars. If you have normal blood sugars, then I know that Dave has basal insulin on board and he's fine. If, if Dave was eating a high carb diet and he had just had a donut and he went up to 400 uh, and he forgot his basal shot or his pump clogged, which are common <clears throat> things, then I wouldn't know if it was the donut or mm. his pump was clogged or whether he forgot his shot. And if that was at nighttime and, and Dave was in college and he goes to bed, he says, oh, I'm 400, I'll come back down or he, he forgets to check. Then when he wakes up in the morning, he's in DKA because he thought it was the donut, Yeah, but it wasn't. It was the lack of insulin. And that's why the people in type one grit don't have DK. Like if you go into the group, you're in the group. There's no yeah. DKA posts. Yeah. People aren't, people aren't, uh, you know, it, it takes a, a really tragic, of course you always have to be on your toes using insulin, but you're not going into uh, DKA because you're showing some ketones with normal blood sugar. So mm -hmm. I, we don't really worry about that. If if I forget Dave's insulin, his blood sugar will go up to 160 and I'll say, shit, we forgot your insulin and mm -hmm. everything will be okay, you know, so. Yeah, um, it's much easier to control if, if it's stable. Once again, Bernstein's law of small numbers. So how much protein does Dave eat um, and how do you work it out? Well, I'm doing one gram per pound myself. And that's pretty much where Roxanne lands. Yep. And then Dave is doing over two. Wow. And if he starts working out and has is in practice, it'll go up to higher than two and a half. And wow. if he's like sedentary, like over Christmas, it'll go down naturally. So his hunger is changes. Yep. His hunger dictates. So we we lead all meals with protein, and he, you know, he's he's allowed to eat as much as he wants to satiety, but that ends up being a pretty consistent daily amount. Yeah. Um, and because he's a growing athlete uh, going through puberty, et cetera, he's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and needs more and more protein than right. uh, you would for your weight. Um, so, right. Yeah. I, I mean, th there's no, there's no worry that he's eating too much protein. There's a lot of myths about kidneys and the protein. I can assure you that, you know, Dave is not going to be in the dialysis clinic eating meat and, egg and running normal blood sugars. So he eats as much protein as he's, as he is, uh, he's welcome to eat as much as I can get for him. And <laughs> I get as much as he can eat. Yeah. And, so, uh, and it's money well spent having a, a stress very healthy type one diabetic son that you're completely proud of. So um, are you worried that his brain isn't going to function without carbs? Um, sometimes, you know, I'm a prof like a professional mathematician and sometimes I sit and do math with Dave and he goes faster than me. So I'm more careful, uh, but sometimes he's faster and wow. uh, I can, I, th I think that my sons are better than me and everything that I can think of. So I don't worry about the brain thing. It's just the opposite. I think what we're doing is geared towards proper brain development. Um, and I think I'm seeing that uh, when I get shamed sometimes in uh, my, you know, my logarithm races or something like that, you know.
nerdy things at the Dykeman household. I love it. Um, so what are you worried about brittle bones and his brains, uh, br uh, bones are going to break because of low carb? Yeah, this is another one. I, I, so the, the critics of the, the low carb, normal blood sugar approach, um, they like to push, you know, fortified grains as if that's the, uh, so what they do is they, they push fortified grains and junk food, and then they, they, they totally disregard the, the, the effects of elevated blood sugars. So that's the game that they play when, when you debate them. And now the kooky idea is that, um, that low carb kids have to have their, their bone mineralization checked. And the funny thing is, if you look in the, the, if you look in the literature, the type ones have brittle bones. And we know that hyperglycemia is terrible for the developing bone structure of, of kids. So uh, it's another area where it's just totally opposite. If you want a kid to have uh, good lean muscle mass, mass, avoid being obese, have strong bones, not be stunted, then you feed them protein and you keep their blood sugars normal. And, and make them lift heavy stuff. Yeah, they'll do that. If you keep them feeling good, they'll yeah. naturally, uh, you, and then you buy some weights. You don't have to put, you don't have to nag them. The, the, these guys will go in and they'll, they'll build their bodies. This idea that kids need to be eating junk food and, and um, to, be, to be feeling normal is nonsense. The kids, the kids want to study. They want to do their homework. They want to go to college. They, they want to date pretty girls or, or handsome boys. They want to build their chests and look themselves in the mirror and feel like they're, they're strong and developing. Kids are cool, you know, and this idea that, oh, you know, they, that's not fair. And he's not going to know what a donut tastes like and all that. Uh, this is just, I think it's just nonsense. Yeah, I hear it all the time. Yeah. Um, so, and final one of the the one you mentioned that low carb myths of how do you make sure Dave gets enough energy? We sort of touched on this a little bit before. Yeah. Well, he just he just uh, he eats. I mean, we feed him. So he it, it's, it in front of him, and he polishes it off. He's so freaking active, like my son. Well, you. you you see these teen boys eating when they're eating normally. I mean, I'm not jealous of my son. That's absurd. But I kind of look at him and I go, God, I wish I would have done what you're doing because mm -hmm. I was always fat, Marty. I was like this fat, pudgy kid uh, to some degree, right? And then I, I leaned out. I got really tall like my junior, senior year. But I was never – like Dave walks around and he looks like, you know – He's got that. He looks like Ted Naiman, you know, like a teenager. He's got <laughs> abs and his back is square. And then, and you know, my my little son is in ninth grade. And he's he's like, come out and you know, come out and spot me. And I said, how much are you benching now? You know, because I haven't been watching him for a while. And dude, he's you know, he looks like Lewis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got the same problem. We we, we got a home gym, and the son's always in there, and even the daughter's in there a whole lot, and they just feed off the healthy food that we've got and eat enough and thrive. And like you say, they want to feel healthy. They want to feel good about themselves. They're going through puberty. They, they want to look attractive to the opposite sex. They don't want to be, you know, just going yeah. on the donut. They need the chips. They need the pizza. You know, we can't deprive them. You, you are depriving them of a, the opportunity to have an amazing, thriving um, you know, manhood, womanhood that's not full of acne and obesity and right. social inconvenience because you don't look the way you want to look. The, the thing is, Marty, the, the parents have to lead the way. If you have a parent who's addicted to these foods and they've got mm -hmm. them around, it's very hard for anybody, let alone a kid, yeah. to just say no to that stuff. You just can't. And it's, you know, that can be, it can look, let's, let's face it. It's, it can be a challenge to the parents to get rid of the food. And um, so you get some beer, bizarre uh, rationalizations about keeping the stuff in the house, you know, like that. I always hear that the six-year-old is sneaking food and it's like, well, the six-year-old didn't go out to the market, to drive, drive down the road and buy the food, you know? <laughs> He stole my credit card and went to Woolies. And 
So you have to do it. You have to do it as a parent, but the payoff is you should, you should see the old pictures of me. I mean, I was a disaster. And you haven't even seen that. You've seen the, some bad pictures, but you haven't seen the worst pictures. <laughs> yeah. And definitely it has to be a whole family change. I mean, um, we feed our kids healthy food. There's different foods that mum eats, Moni eats because she's type one diabetic, but and the kids are more, more active and don't have type one, but the whole family needs to eat well. It can't just be one person sneaking the Doritos and the, the kids expected to eat well while mum's there eating this, that or the other. So it has to be a whole family that needs to change how they eat. It's yeah. I think, it's a slightly different situation with the mom and the kid. I think when you have the kid, the parents really have to uh, have things nailed down or else mm. it's not like, it's just not gonna, you know, yeah. but I have to, I have to work out and stuff too. I mean, I, there's a lot of example setting that I have to do, mm. but really it's about keeping up. And, you know, I, I always get, a, I think I get a little bit too much, uh, I guess, I don't want to say credit, but um, the responsibility for Dave is really coming from him. And I've kind of been, it's not just me setting the example. He's sort of setting the example. So mm -hmm. Really with the workouts, um, if I slack, I hear it. So, <laughs> <kick your nails. laughs> I said, yeah, he's like, not doing deadlifts anymore. I said, you broke my hand. We were playing football, playing catch. I was trying to run routes for him. And he broke my damn finger. I can't even lift the barbell. So, uh, so, so what, do, what does RD stand for? Uh, it doesn't stand for registered dietitian. <laughs> it stands for Richard David, which is which is my name. And uh, I used that when I got on Facebook before I knew what a registered dietitian was. And I was actually banned from Facebook a few years ago. Someone turned me in for saying that I was a registered dietitian. <laughs> I said, no, I called, I called the, they called me, the Facebook called me. I said, my name is Richard David. They said, can you send us an ID? I I said, yeah. That's yeah. unreal. Um, so why do, you, why do you think there's such a resistance to getting this approach out there into the bigger world? I asked Bernstein that question and his response is always better than anything I can cook up, which is that he, he says the situation stinks from every direction. And um, he sees uh, no matter what explanation you come up with, there's more to it. That it, it's, it's one of these problems, like if you read the Malcolm Gladwell books, he's got, um, I forget the name of the book. He, he has an explanation for why airplanes crash. And you need like five or six things to go wrong in combination. Airplane crashes are so rare that when you analyze them, everything's going wrong. And I think that explains the type one situation. Everything has gone wrong uh, in, in type one. And um, I, I don't, you know, I think the message is getting out there now that, that you don't have to um, succumb to the complications and live this constant roller coaster. Um, so, you know, things are changing in a positive way. And I think this option is out there for people, but I still, for newly diagnosed parents, there's such a huge number of concerns that get thrown at them and myths that get thrown at them, myths in my opinion, that um, it's still way too much of an impediment um, to, to try to keep your child healthy. There's, there's mm. so much stacked up against you. Mm. Uh, even if you do hear that this, this method exists, people are, they're terrified of uh, cholesterol and eggs, or they're terrified that their, their son needs, you know, grain to support his brain development or, you know, all these myths that we encounter in mm. non diabetic but non-diabetic life that exist in the nutrition world mm. are amplified like crazy when your kid's life is at stake. Mm. So. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah, and that's where the community aspect of the Facebook community has been so brilliant to just nurture people through the process and just you see other people doing it, you follow other people, you follow their example. I felt like I've watched Dave grow up. It's been amazing. And just to see him thriving now is, is so exciting. And you, you're just seeing all these other kids grow up and 
become healthy adults um, with type 1 diabetes. It must feel amazing for you to have changed, have had a part in changing those lives, but sort of a calling because you've been so affected by that event with Dave nearly dying and, and just, I suppose, angry that there's such, for me, it's sort of an anger that there's so little good, useful nutrition advice out there. And if we can start a groundswell movement, um, we can rock the world and, and make it accessible for the people that really want to, to make the change and make a difference and, and move towards optimal. Well, I think your your book, I think you've accomplished a lot. And I think your book has accomplished a lot. And I think that honestly, your, your book, for people trying to lose weight and combat type two with low carb, your book is essential. But I think your book is essential for type one parents as well, because you can learn so much about metabolism by exploring the world of obesity and type two and 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 the world of vitality and uh i i think your book belongs in that upper echelon with the diabetes solution and a few others ted's book his pe diet book and and your book that there's going to be a collection of books that i think people should get when they and their families get hit by type one. And uh, I think your book shouldn't be just put in the type two and obesity category. I think there's a lot of, lot of things to learn about ketogenic and low carb diets from your book that yeah. people are going to get tripped up on if they don't find your book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I call that Big Fat Keto Lives a sort of a provocative title, but I think there's so many benefits in a lower carb protein focused nutrient dense way of eating um that if you know this way of life dies out with with bernstein and, and a keto fad it'll be lost again for another 20 years and somebody else will have to come up with it again but if we um you know isolate the useful things that we can actually implement and work out why they work and understand how we can apply them better then more and more people can yeah. continue to to learn from the low carb and keto movement, you know, fads come and go, but human nutrition is the same forever. So, um, what what are the what are the top five foods in your family? That's what everybody really wants to know. Is what do you guys eat at home at the dinner table? What does a, a a dinner date with the Dykemans look like? Well, we're we're all very busy. Um, so breakfast and lunch are really pretty standard. You know, it really helps to keep meal plan standard so you know i always say well dave eats you know eggs and a couple of almond flour waffles and some side of meat for breakfast and that has remained pretty constant and that's mm. really a great tool for him because he injects a known dose of regular insulin and then eats that food mm. and then goes about his day so he's fine with the lack of variety and I'm fine with it too. I used to eat a bowl of total cereal every morning with skim milk. I was a disaster as a kid. So I, I was doing the wrong thing. I thought it was right. Um, but um, Dave is, you know, he's hitting the protein pretty hard in the morning. And then lunch is, again, it's some, it's mostly like a meat protein kind of thing just to give him some fuel before practice. And um, then dinner is where things dinner is the big meal of the day and that's just a schedule kind of thing when we're all at the we're all able to cook and and gather as a family and mm -hmm. we might have two dinners with the kids if they're really act in an active phase yeah, wow. um i'll have one but they'll have two and um mm -hmm. we we you know if you've seen ted's food pyramid i love it because that's what we eat man we yeah. eat a variety of protein foods and we eat a variety of vegetables and then we have the occasional keto low carb dessert that comes along for that and um you know th there's not a lot of uh uh you know I, like tonight we're gonna have steak i have we have a lot of beef in the house mm. uh, everybody likes beef but we ate a lot of fish this week we i got some good sea bass this week and um and then costco down the street has fresh caught fresh uh not farm but uh wild salmon we mm. make Whenever they have that, I eat that a lot. Um, yeah, kids, yeah. Eat that. we eat a lot of tuna because we're in Hawaii. Um, my my youngest son likes chicken, so I, I I and and you can cook all that food a number of ways to keep things yeah. interesting. So, 
That's cool. So it's, it's pick a protein and pick a vegetable, man. I mean, that's, you know. <laughs> Rob Wolf, that's simple pretty much. So um, yeah. so if, if somebody's starting out on their type 1 parent journey and they've got a real heart for people with type 1s, I think we've got a few resources. Um, you said this is Bethany's group that you just invited me to the other day. Yeah, yeah. We got type 1. That's a that's a great group. There's a you know, I'm in the group, but there's a lot of really active expert parents in there that really have it dialed in, uh, food and insulin wise. Um, so that that group is, you know, that most of those experts are were you know people that were in the grit and they're still in grit, but then they kind of started this this extra group, and that's kind of the goal with the grit is to see you know more and more spread in social media for mm. um, different types of folks so that's 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 a great group yeah and then yeah. there's the type one grit community page and um we like to post a lot of research from the journals and then you know success stories um the, the research is really powerful and it really favors the approach um it's getting harder and harder to try to voiced a 50% carbohydrate diet on a type one child. Um, there's just not a lot of mm. serious, serious arguments for, for making such a, a, a bad recommendation in the research. Well, you can see even the ADA, the, the, the vilified ADA has, um, has, has changed their tune and it is now admitting that, um, that there's real problems with these high blood sugars. Yeah. Wow. And then you got the the main type one, the original type one grit group. Yeah, that's a that's a group that uh, people that follow the Bernstein approach, and um, there's a lot of experts in that group uh, who understand food and insulin from reading the book as a primary source. So, and and living it and experiencing it. And there's a uh, Dave sharing the good good news of the world, and um, yeah, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, university which is a, an amazing resource i've learned a ton from that and he just like i said he's just such a, a clear thinker and it's going to be a, an amazing resource for a long time to come yeah i'm pretty proud of that yeah i spent a lot of time doing that stuff <laughs> <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of passion a lot of uh exercise demons i suppose a lot of uh frustration with the world out there and yeah. we Want to make a difference and be able to contribute it to help other people on that journey. So, well, it's funny, you know. The the I, I remember getting the book, and then it turns out, you know, that um, you know, Dr. Bernstein has become one of my closest personal friends. It's sort of it's sort of an odd thing to to kind right. of say, but um, I've spent so many hours with him, and then he's he's you know he's in the house, he's on the screen, and and he sees the kids coming and going, and he is the he he is like the nicest person. Um, uh, he is such a good person. So it's really been mm. it's been cool. It's been a cool experience to to you know become close friends with him. You know, yeah, and honored to capture all that knowledge and experience for, for forever. So yeah, um, thank you so much for doing what you do, RD, and and thank you for your nearly hour and a half chat and sharing a journey and um yeah thank you for what you've done for for our family mm. and it's our life would be so much different without the input from grit and uh the friendships we've made over the last six years through this community and the learning and we've all learned together and it's been incredible so yeah thank you so much all, for your time um, we've all learned yeah. together yeah. yeah and um keep doing what you're doing and we'll catch you online thank you so much yeah, I'll, I'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, Marty. <laughs> Cheers, man.